Good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone. I say that advisedly today because we literally have people joining this webinar from all corners of the globe. So we have Africa, Asia, North and South America, Europe and Australia represented on the call. So thank you all so much for uh, joining today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jonathan Hemus. I'm the Managing Director of Insignia. We are a specialist crisis management consultancy and we help leaders of businesses around the world to help them do and say the right things on the worst days of their business lives. And we do that through crisis management planning, training and exercising, and also sometimes advising them during a live crisis. So welcome to all of our clients that have joined us. Welcome to all of our partners, contacts and friends, and welcome to members of the IOD who are joining us today. Uh, I'm going to turn my camera off now and I'll turn it back on for questions just to preserve bandwidth. So uh, I'm still here, but I'm going to go off camera uh, whilst I'm doing the presentation itself. So over the course of the next 40 minutes or so, we're going to be looking at the critical characteristics of an effective crisis management plan. And that is based on my 30 years of experience and the experience of the Insignia team in developing plans and also supporting organizations as they go through crisis. First of all, I'd like to give you a little bit of context. So, Insignia's purpose is to end the needless devastation to people's lives and livelihoods as a result of mishandled crises. We want all business leaders to have the culture, capability and confidence to prevent or overcome crises so they avoid harm to lives, jobs, communities, reputation and financial value. And the reason that I put that up is really that a well-crafted crisis management plan is the first step to enable your organisation to be ready to handle a crisis effectively and therefore avoid the devastation and the harm that we describe within our purpose statement. What we know and what history has shown is that, as Warren Buffett said, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently. That statement is almost literally true. I think more so today than ever before. I think given that businesses are depleted as a result of COVID-19 and not at uh, full strength, it's a lot easier to destroy a reputation and, and, and indeed destroy a business right now, probably than it's ever been. And if you are to preserve your reputation and your business or your organisation in those five minutes, maybe the metaphorical five minutes, having a really good crisis management plan is an important, indeed critical, first step. Again, we know that not just from the Sage of Omaha, but in addition from research, which demonstrates that what you do in response to a crisis will determine the value impact on your organization. This is research from Oxford Metrica where they considered multiple crises and looked at the value impact of crisis events. And what we see is the red line, which shows the what they describe as the loser portfolio, those organizations that lost a tremendous amount of uh, financial value in the year after a crisis. And the blue line shows the winner portfolio, those organizations which actually grew value in the aftermath of a crisis. And what they very clearly concluded was, it's what you do in the first two or three days after the crisis that determines where you will end up. You will see that those that end up as losers, they dive in value much more quickly and in a, a much deeper way than those that ultimately end up as winners. And what Oxford Metrica said was, it is being able to respond appropriately and quickly in those first hours and days that will determine your fate. Again, 
a good crisis management plan will play a really important part in making sure that you get those first few days right and thereby ultimately end up on the blue line rather than on the red line. And we've seen lots of examples over the last decade of organisations which haven't got their crisis response right and have suffered significant reputational, operational, health and safety and value impact as a result. And one of the questions which I always ask myself is, why is it that really successful, much admired businesses led by experienced, smart, intelligent, charismatic leaders can get their crisis response so wrong? It seems unfathomable, but when you look a little bit deeper, there are some very obvious reasons why even senior experienced leaders of very successful businesses can get their crisis response wrong. Two key areas why. Well, firstly, you are facing an extraordinary challenge, literally an extraordinary challenge, something that is completely out of the ordinary or normal uh, business as usual experience. And with that extraordinary challenge comes a number of other parameters, uncertainty. A crisis is always a time of uncertainty. You never know exactly what is going on. You don't have the facts that you need. You'll have lots of rumor, speculation and things that we think are true, but you very rarely have certainty about what is going on. That is uh, discomforting for leaders. Time pressure. We haven't got a week. We sometimes haven't even got a day before making decisions with incomplete information. So time pressure. High stakes. Businesses are, are at risk. Lives can be at risk. Certainly careers can be at risk. Reputations are at risk. So there's an awful lot at stake. And all of this done in the glare of stakeholder attention, whether that's the media, investors, customers, your people, we start to understand why, with that pressure, leaders may not respond in what appears to be a logical, uh, self-interested manner. Secondly, businesses often find themselves having to overcome that extraordinary challenge despite inadequate plans and or ways of working. Trying to muddle through without a plan in a crisis is a recipe for disaster. Trying to apply normal business as usual ways of working rarely works either because there's a different dynamic and a different urgency and a different focus to managing a crisis than to managing business as usual. Secondly, you will often be operating with insufficient resource. You won't have the people that you need. You may not have the technological resources that you need. You may not have the practical logistical resources that you need. Often, one hand is tied behind your back. You may have to overcome this extraordinary challenge with a lack of skills. The people that you have available to you have never been trained on how to respond uh, to a crisis. You may have a team that lacks practice. On this most important day in your business's history, you may be asking a group of people to respond to a crisis without ever having practiced or rehearsed that response. Clearly, there aren't many things that you would want to do in the glare of the global spotlight without having practiced it. So, all of a sudden, it becomes less baffling as to why experienced leaders of successful businesses get their crisis management response wrong. And again, this is why having a plan, a way of working in a crisis is so important. I also wanted to walk you through uh, what I have found to be the top 10 most common crisis management traps. And again, in the second half of the presentation, I'll share with you um, specific ways in which a good crisis management plan can help you avoid 
these top 10 crisis management traps. The first one is that the team is activated too late. All too often in a crisis, I have observed organizations waiting and waiting, hoping for the best, assuming that this is just an incident which is going to go away and is not a crisis, before with the flames licking at their, at their chins uh, or the water right up around their neck, at that point they activate the team. By doing that, you don't give your team the best chance of influencing how the situation plays out. So activating the crisis management team too late, too far into the situation is a very common trap. Secondly, roles and responsibilities are unclear. And I mean this in two ways. Firstly, the role and responsibilities of different parts of your business are unclear. So, for example, I was talking with a contact yesterday and they were talking about their response to COVID-19 and they were saying about how they hadn't fully figured out how head office in New York would collaborate and work with the regions in the event of a crisis. And that's, that's very typical. But if that isn't articulated very clearly ahead of time, what you find is assumptions are made, misunderstandings occur, and what that results in is either duplication of effort, no one doing a job, or worst of all, conflicting things are being done between head office in New York and the regions, for example. The second meaning of roles and responsibilities are unclear. Are roles and responsibilities within your crisis management team? As I mentioned earlier on, almost always you won't have as much resource as you would like in an ideal world in a crisis. That being the case, it's so much more important to make sure that everybody is focused in a purposeful way in doing the things which are going to be most successful in bringing this situation under control and protecting your business, its stakeholders and your reputation. And if people don't really understand what their roles and responsibilities are, that is unlikely to happen. Thirdly, team meetings lack discipline. Now, I'm sure you've all sat in all kinds of meetings where there isn't a clear agenda, the meeting itself isn't particularly well chaired or structured, conversations go off in all sorts of different directions and you end up where maybe decisions haven't been made or actions have been semi-agreed but they haven't been fully assigned and clarified. Sadly, that syndrome applies just as much to a crisis as it does to a normal business meeting. However, the impact of that is much greater. So when teams begin even rehearsing for a crisis, you find that those team meetings lack, lack discipline. It's important that that isn't the case, otherwise you will make insufficiently speedy progress in responding to the crisis. The fourth trap is lack of a shared understanding about what the crisis is or has become. Let me explain. It is important at the beginning of a crisis to articulate the problem that we are seeking to solve. That sounds obvious, but that's kind of the problem, that it may appear obvious, but it's actually not. Assumptions can be made uh, by people within your team about what the priorities are. So let's take a cyber breach, uh, for example. As a, as a very simple example, you might find that the that one person on the crisis management team thinks that the issue is that this is going to uh, this is going to mean that the business cannot transact with its with its customers online. That for him is what the crisis is all about. For another member of the team, she may believe that the issue is that we're going to lose the trust and confidence of our customers because their information may have been compromised. Both of those things are elements of the crisis, but you need to have a laser sharp understanding of what the key problem is that you're seeking to resolve or else you have a team 
which is based on their own individual assumptions and perceptions of what the crisis is, rather than a shared understanding and a purposeful approach. The bit about uh, what the crisis is or has become, the has become bit is also really important. Crises evolve, morph uh, and change shape as they evolve. One of the traps to avoid is for a team to keep their head down, never reassess what it is that we're focusing on and then suddenly they find that they are managing a crisis which was true three days ago but the crisis today is very very different so um, that head down you know straight ahead process is another danger that you need to uh, avoid the fifth one practical logistical and technical issues hinder the team's ability to manage the crisis we can't get zoom to work we haven't got the phone number for the information commissioner's office simple practical logistical and technical issues can be a huge hindrance when every minute counts in a crisis number six fixing the problem is prioritized over protecting reputation in my experience you only ever fully manage a crisis if you can do two things simultaneously one fix the problem get to the heart of what's gone wrong and take steps to put it right and secondly retain the trust and confidence of your stakeholders by communicating with them not one then the other but both at the same time and i'd send a word of warning out there to the organizations on this call which are kind of operationally or technologically focused you often find in organizations with really smart engineers or technologists that their natural uh, gravitational pull is towards fixing the problem which of course is really important but it's just as important to communicate and to retain the trust and confidence of your stakeholders number seven the leadership team focuses on tactical or operational matters. There is a real danger of your CEO who, for example, may have been an engineer in his early life, wanting to get involved in technically sorting out the problem which has caused you this crisis. There's a general instinct of people in a crisis to want to fix things and that extends to your most senior people. That is not helpful. It's not helpful for two reasons. One, you have real experts, current experts, who should be fi fixing the tactical and operational matters. And if your leadership team is doing that, what they're not doing is providing the guidance, strategic direction, making the big decisions that they need to be provided. In fact, providing. In fact, they are stepping on the toes of those who should be doing those jobs. Number eight decisions are made too late or not at all because there isn't uh, complete information in a crisis there is always a danger of teams wanting and waiting for another piece of information before making a decision or before communicating that's dangerous because what it may mean is you never make a decision or you make a decision on day three, which means you have missed the boat. In order to influence a situation, you have to make early decisions with incomplete information. And teams and leaders in particular need to become comfortable with making the best decision they can with the information they have available at that particular time. And they may need to make a different decision tomorrow, but if you make no decision today, you leave yourself without real influence over what is going on. Number nine, communication is too slow, inadequate and or inappropriate. Too slow is really the syndrome uh, above. Often uh, when we're working with communication teams, understandably, because the situation is changing constantly, the statement they want to put out is changing constantly. But at a moment in time, you have to say, at 10 o'clock this morning, this is the situation. We're not going to put that next piece of information in because otherwise you'll keep 
putting that next piece of information in and you'll never get to the point at which you issue your first statement. You can issue another one, you can issue an update, but that is one of the reasons why communication is too slow. And we also see um, insufficient communication in a crisis. You know, you may be issuing five or six statements on a single day. You know, the idea of one a day or one a week is probably not going to cut it in a crisis. And the inappropriate bit is about getting your messaging right. And finally, one of the traps that we often see is teams simply reacting to events. So they are following behind the crisis rather than shaping events. And one of the best ways of avoiding that is through scenario planning. But uh, your aim should be to be managing the crisis, not having the crisis manage you. OK, so there are my 10 crisis management traps from, as I say, over 25, 30 years of experience. And if you can avoid those traps, then you have a significantly better prospect of managing a crisis well and avoiding the damage that would otherwise accrue. A crisis management plan is one of the ways that you can help to avoid those traps. And I believe that's even more important right now because I believe we are navigating a new danger zone right now. And I appreciate because we are speaking to a global audience today that there will be countries in different stages of the, of, of the pandemic on this call. But as we begin to move out of the initial outbreak in, in Europe, certainly, there is a danger that actually your business is more at risk now than it was a month or two ago. Why? Well, I think it's because there are a number of reasons, but firstly, because there was almost safety in numbers. When every business was going through the same crisis, you had to get it seriously wrong in order to be picked upon by the media or other stakeholders. Now that, say in Europe at least, we are coming out of that first phase, there is no longer safety in numbers and there's certainly no excuse for not being ready to respond either to, you know, another outbreak of COVID-19 or indeed any other crisis. You know, you will be forgiven for maybe not uh, deploying a perfect response first time round. I think stakeholders will be significantly less forgiving in this new context and we're seeing that in some of the incidents that are occurring at the moment. So in Germany, for example, Tun is uh, one of the country's uh, largest meat processing firms, have been severely criticised for the, the way in which they allowed an outbreak to occur within their, within their facility and also for their lack of a full communication response to it. So this is an example where they probably didn't get the operational or the communication response right, but they are being called out as an individual business. They are not being hidden behind every other business. But it isn't just uh, coronavirus related crises that we need to be ready for right now. There are other things going on in the world, not least Black Lives Matter. Many of you will have seen the damage that's been done to uh, CrossFit as a result of uh, its CEO's tweet about the George Floyd murder. Um, he had to leave the company, he had to resign as CEO, and just this week he has now sold the business. Reebok have cut off ties with, with CrossFit. So it's an example of how reputational issues at the moment can bring you to your knees. And it's about being aware of the context in which crises are happening. And then, shall I say, the more conventional crises are also happening. So Honda was hit by a cyber attack a couple of weeks ago, which brought its, uh, its operations to a halt. Again, I mention this because we know that cyber attacks and cyber incidents have been around for a number of years now. And prior to uh, COVID-19, it was what a lot of crisis planning and training and exercising was about, it hasn't gone away. And sadly, there is more of it at the moment because uh, the cyber criminals know 
that businesses are vulnerable. They've got people working from home. They may not have the same levels of security. Phishing attacks may be easier as individuals click on links from health organizations or banks or retailers that they're expecting to hear from. So it's not just about having a crisis management plan now that protects you from a second wave of COVID-19. It's also about having a crisis management plan which will protect you from, shall I say, the more conventional crises. So we're about, we're under halfway through, we've got about half an hour to go. Please do um, post questions as we go through. I will deal with them at the end, but uh, please do post them as we go through. Piece of research that we, that we did, I'm just going to draw your attention to uh, the second statistic on this slide, uh, which when talking to over 100 businesses at the end of May, 30%, only 30% of them, said that their crisis management plan had worked extremely well in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. So only 30% of businesses said that their crisis management plan worked extremely well in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. That deficit needs to be addressed now because the next crisis could be even more damaging to business than the one that we are just coming out of. And so in the second half of this presentation, I want to talk you through the nuts and bolts and insights of what makes for an effective crisis management plan. And I use the word effective uh, advisedly. I hope many or most of you do have crisis management plans, but the key question is, is it really going to help you under pressure in a crisis? And the first thing I want to talk about is what a crisis management plan is not. It is not a step-by-step -step instruction manual for every conceivable crisis scenario. It is not a completely inflexible rule book of what you must do in response to a crisis. It is not a replacement for judgment and decision making. So the idea that a crisis management plan is a, is a panacea, is a a magic wand, the solution to all of your problems in a crisis is misplaced. The thing about it not being a step-by-step -step instruction manual for every conceivable scenario plays to the fact that if you base your crisis management plan purely on your biggest risk scenarios, purely on your biggest risk scenarios, what happens if the crisis that occurs is not one of those potentially biggest risk scenarios. You risk being completely blindsided uh, by having a plan which doesn't address the very thing that has happened. A completely inflexible rule book, no, because, final bullet point, your team, your leaders need to use their judgment and make decisions. Um, it's not up to the plan to make decisions for you. And I know that uh, Gus Whitcomb is on our call today. And Gus, I'm going to use uh, a quote from a webinar that you uh, participated in uh, a while back about your experiences of 9-11. Uh, Gus uh, is the former managing director of corporate communications at American Airlines and was on American Airlines crisis management team on 9-11. And this really plays to the thing about not having a plan which only relates to a very fixed set of scenarios, Gus said. We went straight to our plan and in about 10 seconds realized it wasn't designed for what we were facing. Our plan was focused on one aircraft, not two. It was focused on one location, not two. We had intended to tell our story, one of the basic principles of crisis communications. And yet the very first phone call from the White House was that we shouldn't say a word. And so all of a sudden, we weren't able to tell our story. We planned to fly to the cities where the crisis occurred and help those involved and their families. But all the air traffic was grounded. And so there we were with this wonderful, beautiful plan that would have worked if we had one airplane in one location. We were able to fly 
where we where we were supposed to go to and we could tell our story but it just wasn't the case and so we had to improvise what we were going to do next so um thank you for that insight and for that quote gus and the point for me that comes out of that is your plan needs to be flexible enough to respond to whatever has happened not uh, for you to be straitjacketed into a certain set of uh, scenarios. So, if I've talked about what a crisis management plan is not, I should also explain to you what it is. Here for me are some of the key benefits and the purpose of a crisis management plan. It sets you off on the right track. And by setting you off, I mean almost literally the first hour of the crisis, which used to be called the golden hour. It's still a phrase that is used, but it is important to get the very first things right. And a good crisis management plan will enable you to do that. Building on that, it will enable you to get the first 24 hours right. And if you tick both of the, those first two boxes, as we saw from the Oxford Metrica research, you are already on the right track to protecting your business, its reputation and the lives and livelihoods of your stakeholders. Thirdly, it provides prioritization and focus. We talked earlier on about how in a crisis, there's enormous pressure, there's this lack of information, there's high stakes. Having a plan, which you've considered carefully beforehand, enables you to prioritize and focus on the right areas which will have most impact on dealing with that situation. It helps you to avoid omissions or oversights. You know, brains are scrambled uh, during a crisis. Adrenaline is, is flowing like crazy. And having checklists means that you don't forget the one really important thing that you should do. You'll remember 99 of them, but it might be the hundredth thing that is going to cause your downfall. Having a plan which gives you that, uh, that handrail to help you avoid emissions or oversights is really helpful. It helps you to effectively deploy scarce resources by articulating roles and responsibilities and tasks at a very granular level. It means that you can make best use of the people that you have at your disposal. It enables you to make good decisions quickly. It won't make the decisions for you, but it will give you a structure and a framework and a process for making good, early, well-judged decisions. It establishes battle rhythm. In a crisis, there is a bit of a rhythm to the way in which the team operates and a plan helps you to establish that rhythm early on. And in summary, it provides sound and reliable processes at a time of great uncertainty and pressure. So it is kind of the antidote to the emotion, the adrenaline, the pressure that the crisis presents. I'm going to um, talk to you about what your plan should contain. But before doing that, I want to talk to you about five things that I think should uh, be a precursor to actually developing your plan. Critically, in any organisation, you need the buy-in, support and endorsement of your senior management team for crisis management planning. That is so important and so helpful uh, in terms of really making progress in embedding and uh, developing a crisis management plan. Secondly, you should be clear on your plan scope and its purpose. Understand what it is that the plan is designed to do. There have been a number of occasions in my career whereby um, an organisation has shown me their crisis management plan and it's turned out not to be a crisis management plan. It's turned out to be a crisis communication plan. Crisis communication plans are critically important. As I talked about earlier on, it's at least half of your response, but it isn't the entirety of your response. So having clarity around 
what this plan covers and what it is designed to do is really important before you start drafting it because otherwise again we're drafting something without real focus thirdly and this relates to the second one be very clear on the crisis management plans place within your overall risk management ecosystem what do i mean by that well it may be within your business you have emergency response pre procedures you have business continuity plans, business impact analysis, risk registers. It's important to understand where all of these interrelated plans and procedures and assessments sit and you know what the hierarchy is of them and how they fit together because they should fit together. If you've got plans that contradict or overlap or uh, or conflict with each other, you have a recipe for disaster. So understanding where it fits in is important. Map out your risks and engage in scenario planning. You'll remember I said 10 minutes ago that your plan should not be entirely based on your five biggest risks and what you would do in response to them. And I wholeheartedly believe that. However, what you should do is identify what those top five risks are and have checklists against them let's say as an appendix to your main crisis management plan because if a cyber incident is a high risk for your organization why wouldn't you have a checklist for that but it's just important that the entire plan is not predicated on a fixed and predetermined uh, set of risks so what should your plan contain i think there are four areas that your crisis management plan should contain the first are the foundational uh, elements they are the definition of a crisis your principles for crisis management categorization of crisis types and levels roles and responsibilities team contact details and plan and team activation process a quick canter through those elements definition of a crisis is important because in simple terms it means that when one happens you can recognize it you remember the trap of not activating the team until it was too late in your plan articulating what the characteristics of a crisis are and maybe listing some examples helps you to say Do you know what this looks very much like a crisis let's activate the team principles for crisis management stating explicitly what we are seeking to achieve through crisis management it shortens the discussion at the beginning of the crisis team meeting if we've already predetermined broadly in a crisis this is what we are seeking to achieve categorization of crisis types and levels it may be that there are different grades of response or different types of response depending on the severity or type of crisis the plan can articulate what those levels are roles and responsibilities at this point i'm primarily talking about broadly within your business who manages what so what is head office responsible for what are the country offices or your divisions responsible for real clarity around who has accountability for what when a crisis happens team contact details for obvious reasons and a plan and team activation process nothing matters unless you are able to activate your team quickly you can have the best plan in the world but if you can't get your team together quickly onto a zoom call then you are not going to uh, begin uh, influencing that crisis so those foundations are really important because it, because it forms the start of your crisis management response the second area are um, uh, resources which help you to manage the crisis itself firstly the overall crisis management process I think it's really helpful to have a flow chart on a single piece of paper which shows the process that we are applying to manage our crisis second thing is a team meeting agenda I talked about purposeful meetings by having a standing agenda for your crisis team meetings it enables you to have uh, a structure and a rigor as to how you uh, operate as a team 
first our action checklist i've talked a lot about making you know a strong and swift start to your crisis response having a checklist of what must be accomplished within that first hour is the start point for su successfully doing that but also role specific action checklists so within your team you will have different people responsible for different things and each of those roles will have checklists around what they must achieve both in the first hour but also beyond that so real clarity of what they are required to do in their roles we've got just under 20 minutes to go i can see we have questions already but do please uh, keep posting them the third area i would describe as supporting materials things which are just really useful and you will almost certainly need when you're dealing with a crisis all in one place resources for example site plans forms and templates whatever your way of managing information there should be the forms and templates within your plan obviously also available electronically how to guide so we don't have those logistical uh, issues that we talked about earlier on how to how to set up a zoom call yes it's obvious but it's not so obvious when maybe a, a c-suite person has to do that and they've not done it before so there should be a really clear simple uh, um, flow of how to do some of those critical things that support the team and again contact details not now just uh, the crisis management team itself but all of the other critical stakeholders with whom you might need to communicate in a crisis. And I don't just mean communicate in the sense of um, the media or getting messages out there. There will be partners uh, that you need to work with in order to respond to the crisis. Make sure you have all of their details. I know during COVID, I came across a, you know, a number of organizations that didn't have full details of their supply chain and so it just slowed them down in terms of responding and the final area of critical content is communication within the communication section of the plan and alternatively it's fine to have a separate uh, crisis communication plan which integrates with your main crisis management plan it should include key communication principles probably the most important of which is the approval process which needs to be uh, determined ahead of time template communication materials against those key risks holding statements internal briefings customer briefings tweets other social media content having templated materials that require um, just tailoring in the event of a crisis saves you valuable time when you're under enormous pressure forms and templates media log a briefing to be read out to your um, switchboard operators and again how to guides if i'm responsible for uploading material to a website or maybe someone else on a day-to-day -day basis is responsible but for whatever reason they're not available to the communication team within your communication plan it needs to have instructions as to for example how to upload material to your website so four critical areas of content the foundations in other words how to get your team up and running and working effectively quickly tools which help you to manage the crisis as it develops supporting materials the resources you would need to help you make sense of what's going on and the communication element as you will understand simply having a crisis management plan isn't enough the first thing that you need to do uh, is to brief people on what the plan says, what it means, um, and how it is to be deployed. So a plan briefing is essential. You have to tell people what is in the plan and what their role is within it. Talking of their role within it, I'm a big advocate of training for team members, even for the administrator, the person keeping the log. It sounds obvious keeping notes on a, on, on, on a whiteboard. It's not so easy in practice with, you know, the emotions and the noise and the conflict going on, uh, whether it's a teleconference, a Zoom meeting or a physical meeting, that person requires training. Rehearsal, this thing about getting muscle memory, the plan's important, but once it's rehearsed, it starts to become second nature. 
continuous improvement. You know, as you go through crises or have near misses or minor incidents, it's critical to constantly improve that plan. Review what happened, learn from it, agree actions and enhance it. An active leadership. Again, um, this comes back to your leadership team and senior managers within the business championing crisis management to make sure that the plan isn't a crusty document that sits on a shelf, but one which is a living, breathing document which is embedded within the DNA of the organisation. Now, I'm sure that many of you already have plans. I'm sure that many of you have the ability to develop your own plans. I wanted to, for those of you that don't, I wanted to talk briefly about how Insignia could help you to uh, develop such resources. If you already have a plan, but you would like to um, see how to enhance it to make sure that it's ready to protect you in a crisis. There are three things that I can suggest. One, on our website, we have a free online crisis scorecard, which will analyze and assess your crisis readiness across four parameters. It will generate a tailored bespoke report for your organization with uh, recommendations and advice as to what to do next. That, that as I say, is completely free. It's on our website. I'll give you uh, well, you've got the address there, but I'll give you our website address again at the end of the presentation. Paid for services, if you'd like our help, we can audit your current crisis management plan against best practice. We'll generate a report, make recommendations and an action plan to make your plan even better. And the third thing, the crisis management review workshop. With a number of clients, we are currently helping them to take the learnings out of what happened in the initial pandemic outbreak find out what went well, find out what didn't go so well, and then translate those into actions to be implemented within their crisis management plans. It's so important to make sure that you have the best possible plan right now. So there's three ways that we can help you with uh, an existing crisis management plan. Three ways that we can help you if you don't have a plan at all at the moment. Uh, and this is uh, in a descending order of price. We can develop your crisis management plan for you. So it's totally bespoke and we take the pressure off and we deliver it for you. We can do it in a collaborative way in which it is based on a template. You provide us with information based on a questionnaire. We then populate the template or guided whereby the uh, plan is based on Insignia's plan template, but you join a cohort of three or four or five other businesses with regular webinars uh, and one-to-one -one virtual support from us to develop your own plan. As I say, tends to be the smaller businesses that go for the guided approach, see the, the bigger clients and bigger organizations that go for the bespoke approach. So forgive me for a brief sell, but I do want you uh, to have a great plan by the time the next crisis happens. Why? Well, because there has been uh, a lot of, as you will have heard, discussion and uh, criticism that the world, countries, businesses weren't ready for the initial pandemic outbreak and they should have been. A lot of people saying this was not a black swan event and a lot of analysis of why organisations do uh, fail to prepare for disasters. As I mentioned earlier on, I believe we are now going into uh, a danger zone and as Dr. Hans Kluger, the director of the World Health Organization said, therefore, now is the time for preparation, not celebration. However you get to this point, I would strongly, strongly encourage you to make sure that you have a plan which is ready to protect your business, its value, its reputation, its stakeholders in the event of another crisis coming along in the next six months. Do be very aware of those crisis management traps that I talked about earlier on. Make sure that your plan gives you the ways of working to give you a head start in a crisis to make sure that you emerge with your business and its reputation intact. I'm now going to uh, move on to questions. We have uh, nine minutes left. So let me just have a look at what questions we have here. Um, 
is the CEO usually the best CMT leader in most crises? If not, who? Great question, Philip. Um, it does it does depend. Um, sometimes the CEO very much wants to be the CMT leader, and sometimes that makes sense. There is a danger in that, though, because being the CMT leader um, is a big responsibility in its own right, and the CEO may need to be deployed in a different way during the crisis, whether that's as the spokesperson, whether it's as an ambassador having to go to a site where a crisis is happening. In a number of our clients, it is the CEO who chairs the CMT. Uh, in others, it's the COO or even the crisis coordinator. What I would say is whether or not the CEO um, chairs the CMT or is the CMT leader, clearly, ultimately, they are responsible for decision making and that is not a responsibility that they can abdicate and you know when a crisis happens it is absolutely the acid test of a leader uh, and you know their future career can sometimes be defined uh, by that so um, next question from Lawrence I note early on you advised responding in days in certain industry that could be minutes and hours your thoughts please yes forgive me if I didn't uh, communicate that clearly Lawrence what I meant was the uh, aggregation of what you do over that um, two or three day period will definitively determine whether you end up as a winner or loser on that Oxford Metrica graph but absolutely, your first response is critical. And by first response, I mean minutes and hours. Uh, they used to say when I began in this business 30 years ago, the first 24 hours are crucial. I would absolutely concur that the first hour, certainly the first three hours are crucial. And that's why having you know, a plan which enables you to respond in the right way is so important. Um, how uh, how valuable is media training, i.e. standing in front of a media scrum question from, from Steve? It's very important. Um, it's important because it is another moment of high stress and high pressure. So you need to have a team of um, pre-prepared, pre-trained, confident, competent spokespeople um, to respond to uh, media interest and particular particularly as you described steve a media scrum many is the instance when uh, that has gone wrong and has you know made a crisis into an even worse crisis question that often follows that question is again should our ceo be our spokesperson i would say in general you should be putting forward your best spokesperson the one that is empathetic uh, appropriately confident but whilst remaining uh, human um, and that person doesn't have to be your CEO it only has to be your CEO if it is a crisis of the most serious magnitude in other words where there are fatalities or let's say for example huge environmental impact um, right I'm gonna there are more um, where do you see crisis management fitting into the jargons of resilience, BCP, EP, media plan, operational plans, et al? Um, Lawrence, that's uh, yeah a topic of much debate. In my in my view, when I describe a crisis management plan, I view that as being the strategic document which sits above the other documents that you that you mention to guide the organization's overall response to a crisis. Uh, say it's about strategy, it's about leadership, it's about direction, it's often about communication as well. As well. Um, you know, emergency response, I think that is really about the immediate uh, efforts to uh, save life and to save the environment and to protect buildings, but that's the very immediate response. Um, the crisis management plan, as I say, I see as being a longer term plan used by the leadership team and senior managers within the business to guide their response 
to a crisis. Um, I've got a question here from Ailish. We prioritise exercising over planning. Is that a bad idea? Um, in an ideal world, Ailish, I would suggest that you should be doing both. Um, you know, having a plan and then rehearsing it is the ideal scenario. Um, what I would say, and I touched on it earlier on, is that simply having a plan but not briefing, training or rehearsing it, frankly, is unlikely to be a very much help to you. There is no way in the world that a, a perfect plan that no one has been briefed, trained or exercised on will be successfully deployed in a crisis. So if I was pushed and, you know, uh, an organisation could only exercise or could only have a plan, frankly, I would say they, they would be better off exercising than simply having a plan. But clearly, really, if you want to be uh, confident that you would do and say the right things under enormous pressure, you want both. So I don't think it's an either or. I think it is a it is a both. Um, who and how can trigger the crisis management plan? Um, I guess I will answer, answer that question in a slightly uh, different way. What is critical is that word gets to the person who is allowed to activate the team as quickly as possible. And what that means is when there is a problem at the front line, the fact of that problem needs to be escalated through your organisation at pace. And so, yes, the first prerequisite for um, successful crisis management is activating your plan and that requires a swift chain of communication to get word through to the appropriate uh, the, the, the appropriate person who activates the plan. And one of the other um, things we always advise to our client is, you know, activate your, your team um, or at the very least put them on standby. If there's any whiff that there might be a crisis, it's much better to stand the team down than to respond too late. And, you know, one of our clients, they activated their, or rather put their crisis management team on standby uh, early in February uh, in response to the pandemic, which was way earlier than many other uh, teams did. They didn't begin meeting on a daily basis until a few weeks after that, but they were ready. That They were vigilant, they were ready to go. Um, it is now getting towards the hour, so thank you so much for joining us this morning, this afternoon, this evening. Um, please do make sure that you have a plan which will protect you in the coming danger zone. Please do contact us if there's any way that we can help put you into that position. But in the meantime, again, thank you for your time and attention this afternoon. If there's any questions that I haven't been able to cover, you have my contact details here and I'm more than happy to deal with them offline. Um, but otherwise, yeah, thank you. Have a good and crisis free afternoon and I wish you well. Thank you very much.